watches and our phones so we can coordinate with each other. But for God, it's eternity. See, God lives in eternity, but he made time to put grace and mercy in so that he could redeem us to himself. So time is actually an abnormality in eternity. But God did it because he had love for us. Amen. One of the first verses I ever learned the scripture of was um, in the Gospel of John. And it was John 3. And can anybody say what the verse is? 16. All right. And, and can we say it all together? King James Version now. For God so loved the world that... Come on. Okay, we, we did real good, but we're going to do it one more time, if you all don't mind. For God so loved the world. Go ahead. Uh-huh. Amen. What a wonderful scripture. It's one of the first I ever learned because that's what they taught us in Sunday school. That was one of the first ones. But you know what? It is the foundation of all scriptures. If God had not done that, we wouldn't have time for mercy and grace. Amen. If God had us stuck to just judgment only, without love, we would have never, ever made it. So I thank God for this time in which we come together where we're able to discuss the scriptures chosen in Christ. Um, let's give a little background. Um, Paul was probably at the same place he was when we talked about him in Philippians. He was writing to, and, and we have, if you look at the first two verses of the book of Ephesians, it was Paul writing to, and we should say, more than to the Ephesian church, he was writing to the Ephesian area. And the thought is that these scriptures, these epistles that Paul wrote, such as the one to the Ephesians, were actually passed around from church to church. Because that was one of the ways they got an understanding of what God was doing in the Gentile world and even in the Jewish world at that time. Was they went around and talked about what was Paul talking about. Okay? The reason why is... Paul was at a point where he was at, later in life and the mysteries of the gospel and the mysteries of God towards man were revealed in him and people wanted to know what was God doing. It wasn't for the purpose of them just knowing what Paul wrote. The purpose that Paul understood all apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors, helps, administrators, all of that was for one reason, that the believers might understand God's will for themselves and carry out his will. Our, our, our goal is not to lead you just to be leading you. It's to put you in a place with knowledge and understanding that you may know the God of your salvation to the extent that you're able to obey him by the leading of the Holy Spirit when there's nobody else to show you anything. It's really important that we understand that. That the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit would come, he would lead and guide you into all truth. Amen. And truth is nothing that is static. It's dynamic. The truth for you today is not the truth for you tomorrow because God can tell you to do something different than he's told you to do before. Somebody says, well, God doesn't change. And that's a fact. He doesn't change. But part of his unchanging is that he may ask you to do what you didn't do the day before. Okay? So it's important to understand that God is an everlasting God and ever looking for us to do more and more. So if you turn to the scriptures... In Ephesians, we're talking about chosen in Christ. And if I impart anything to you today, and I may ask you for some help, uh, those of you that have your Bibles and remember your verses or your phones or whatever, I may ask you for some help in looking up some scriptures while we're talking, okay? But what we want to do is chosen in Christ is such an important thing. Paul was doing something a little different 
in the region of Ephesus. And it's really important that we understand this. In a lot of cases, Paul wrote epistles to correct behavior of the believers. In the book of Ephesians, that's not where he's at. He's more encouraging them to understand the depth of the salvation of God so that they're able to understand this is not just something that happened to you one day, but that it goes all the way back before God ever made the earth. Oh man, that God had it in his mind and understanding that you would be saved. Now it's, it's very powerful. This chosen in Christ is very powerful. And let me give you an example. Do you think anything sneaks up on God? Okay, does God know the beginning from the end? Okay, now, if it has a beginning and it has an end, then it is less than God because that's called time. It has a beginning and it has an end. Eternity doesn't have a beginning and end. Only time does. But he knows the beginning of times and he knows the end of times. Now, it's a head scratcher. Because I, I want to tell you this, and, and I, used to, I used to ponder these things. I don't know if you have or not, but I used to ponder and say to myself, wait a minute. I know he's everlasting. I know he was here before anything was. Then I have to correct that and say, no, he wasn't here before anything was. He just was. <laughs> okay? <laughs> he just was. Everything else had a beginning but him. And I said, but yet he could predestine what he would do when I accepted him, knowing what would happen, but not interfering with it except by my will. And I said, you gave me choice while you gave me a predestination. That's powerful. So let me be very clear with you. You may have been abused. You may have been subject to trauma, uh, violence, molestation, drugs, abandonment, and all those things. But when you came to Christ, he said from the beginning of the foundations, I decided you would be mine. I could care less what you did because when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ you now have activated the predestination of God in your life powerful because that means mothers in my not living up to what I want to be in Christ he's still faithful to continue to finish that which he started in me. Even when I'm not sure if it's right or not. Or if I can make it. He's still saying I've put in you something that I'm going to finish it. All you have to do is hang out with me. What we do for Christ is not us doing it. But it's Christ doing it in us. Chosen in Christ. This is powerful. So we're going to go through the scriptures here. There's a lot of blessing in this. Does anybody remember the, uh, we used to call them, um, uh, uh, Preacher Brown helped me out. What did we used to call the fifth chapter of Matthews when Jesus began to teach them? We, we called them what? How my attitude should be? All right, that's what we used to say, but that isn't what beatitude actually means, okay? It actually means, it said, blessed are those. And what the Lord meant by blessing is happy, to be glad. So Paul starts us out here. He talks about in the first and second verse, if we'll go to the um, ESV uh, standard version for the uh, ESV version, English standard version for this on the screen that'll help us out a little bit but um, you may look at it in the King James but I also want to look at it at the ESV as well let me go to that one moment okay so I'm going to read it in that I have the King James as well but I want to 
really make sure we understand some things. So the first thing that Paul wrote in the third verse was one thing. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? That's the first thing he said. Blessed in the third verse of Ephesians, the first chapter. Okay? Now, in the ESV, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, this is... This is factor so happy okay be the God and Father be happy about this that God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ has made us happy cause us to be raptured called us to be joyful cause us to be glad cause us to be astounded surprised and glad because of this happening Remember, this isn't just us on the scene by ourselves. The angels are also watching and also made happy that God is redeeming that which he created beyond what Satan was able to do to try to stop it. Remember, Satan is not God's enemy. What? God can't have an enemy. There is no equality between Satan and God. Satan acknowledges that God is God. His enemy is us. It's the created against the created, not the uncreated. God is not created. So when we say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this is important here, okay, because it's showing sonship and relation as family here, okay, we're not speaking Godhead here. We're speaking family and understanding. If you read 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter and the 25th verse, the Bible says, and, and David talked about this back in Psalms. He said, the Lord said unto the, my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And he says, and when he has brought all things unto him, then shall the son give up to the father that God may be all in all. See, God did this. He did this number. He said, listen, I want, he, he, he did some wonderful things. God basically said this. I don't want the devil to be able to figure out what I'm doing, so I'm going to do a trick. And he tricked the devil. Somebody says, how did he trick the devil? Well, let me give you. The, 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 the trick according to the gospel of Von Zell. Okay? You don't have to accept it, but search the scriptures. God basically did this. Man is sinned. Okay? Did you know that God knew that Adam was going to sin? God was not surprised by that. But you know what surprised Satan? Satan thought, ah, he sinned, so that's it. And God said, no, it ain't over that easy. I love these folks. And how can you prove love for someone unless they do something against you and then you decide to forgive them even when they don't deserve forgiveness? So God established a rule back then that says, if I forgive you when you've done against me, you are forgiven. And he established that rule. Then God did something that was unbelievable. At the Tower of Babel, when they decided to come together to build the tower, God said, no, 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 no. I want to play this to the end. So God said, nope, I'm going to stop the Tower of Babel. Somebody said, so they wouldn't get to heaven. Nope, he wanted them to be scattered. And the Bible says he took among all the people and he scattered them across the earth why because from there when he said the woman's seed shall bruise the devil's head and you shall bruise his heel now satan couldn't figure out which way is god gonna bring this to past he scattered and they didn't understand what he was talking about. wait wait a minute we can't figure it out how is he gonna bring salvation forward if he has all these people scattered so he did that and if you, if you don't, you should look in the scriptures. The Bible not only says that he scattered them, 
after that, but that he gave dominion of angels over those that he scattered. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but search the scriptures. In them, the Bible is very clear. That's why you had Daniel and Michael fighting the prince of Persia when he prayed for a time because there was given domain in the war in heaven talking about not in heaven where God's throne is but in the atmosphere and space of the earth this is what was is occurring what I'm trying to get to you all is one thing God didn't do all this to just show his majesty he did this to show his glory in you Think about the planning that he put into salvation for your life. So he did this all through time. And Satan wasn't sure, so he made this chosen people. So he afflicted Israel as much as possible to try to stop it from happening. And I love how the Lord really made this chosen in Christ work so well. You know, I said, wow, it would have been tough. Pastor Brown, it would have been tough. If everybody in the lineage of Christ had been great people. But Abraham was a liar. Isaac was a liar after him. They both lied about their wives being their half sisters. Okay. Jacob was a swindler. Rahab was a harlot. I said, what are you doing, Lord? He says, I'm proving that my trick can move through every little sin. So when I chose you in Christ, there's nothing I can't forgive. Because I brought it down in me till it got to me and it stopped. Because I overcame the world. I brought all power in heaven and earth by God's, my Father's power under me. How? Because I can forgive everything that happened up until that time. When we say you're chosen in Christ, stop thinking about denominations. Stop thinking about all those things. Think about the God of heaven in this universe saying, I chose you. And no matter how little you think you are, he said, i proven with my very life that I came down and said, I shed blood for you. And the blood, the Bible says, like the typical tabernacle in the wilderness, there's a mercy seat in heaven. And the blood of Jesus there allows us to be forgiven, not for one sin, come on now, but forever. Now, how can we do that? How can we do that? Because he is God. See, the one thing that Satan understood when he took the, uh, the Lord into the wilderness. See, Satan is not dumb. I, I don't know. We, we call demons and all that dumb, but they're not dumb, okay? You can't fight Michael being the prince of Persia being dumb, okay? But... He even understood, if I'm going to trip you up, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to have to use scripture. Because even the devil realized I can't use anything else. Because I'm created just like man, so I can't use but what you've given in heaven to be used. That's why we can use the power of the word, because it's created by God for us to use. Just as much as Satan is able to use it. See, Satan seeks to trick the intent of Scripture. And it's for us, through knowledge and understanding, to give its actual truth. So when we look at this, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Let me explain this. It's not just your existence here on the plane of the earth in spiritual warfare and in spiritual citizenship you live in heavenly places in Christ above the rule and wisdom of this world so when I, I told you before whenever I speak my prayers 
I don't speak them as I'm bowed down, kneeling at my bed, praying to God, Lord, please do this. That's not where I pray from. I pray in heavenly places in Christ. Okay? Let me give you an example, a great example of this. Deacon Marsh. Y'all see him? He's wearing glasses, nice, mild-mannered. He could work for the Daily Planet. But when he goes to pray, he jumps into something called a telephone booth. And out comes super godly Marsh. And he begins to pray from that level. He's no longer the mild man or daily planted reporter he normally is. Because he's coming from a place of Jesus Christ. Of being chosen in him from heavenly places. No longer this from here, but here to there. Now somebody says, how can you prove that? When you talk from heaven, remember what the scripture says. They were ascending and descending. It's not about what happens just here. We go to there to bring there right here. For that's what God actually did with Jesus Christ. He said, listen, you're here, but I need you there. So that between here and there, I got the whole book covered. Your life from beginning of time to eternity is covered by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you have eternity now. How can you prove that? That's why Paul said, for me, to die is gain. Okay? To live is for you, but for me to die is gain. Because the same thing that happened with Jesus Christ is going to happen with us. Now, why am I going here? Because this is important that we get this understanding. The Bible tells us that when the trump of God is sounded, the dead in Christ shall rise when? First, right. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught together. Now somebody says, well, why would the dead in Christ rise first if they're already with the Lord? Ah. Remember what the Lord did on the cross. He said this. Father, into thy hands I do what? I commend my... When... You pass. Your, your life is so hidden in Christ that when any of us leave this earth, our spirit and soul go with Christ. Well, why did the dead have to rise again? Because just like Jesus' spirit went to his father, there still was a need for that earthly body to be changed to come back up. So he went back to the body so he could be risen. That's why the dead in Christ shall rise first, for their spirit and soul will reunite with a body that is now celestial and rise. How beautiful that is. So... We have to look at Christ. What, isn't it exciting, y'all? How many of y'all have flown without a plane? I mean, raise your hand if you have. I just want to know. Raise your hand if you haven't flown without a plane. Uh, you've flown in a plane. Okay. You will have the opportunity to do what no one else has done before. And that is to meet him in the air and I love that whole thing why meet him in the air because the Lord is showing that you have power not just over gravity but over all the dominion and power of the enemy in the air you are no longer just bound here on earth but how you have lifted yourself in the spirit of God you now do so physically we have an amazing future ahead of us, church. An amazing future. So let's go to the fourth verse. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. Holy? Now, holy, that's a different word. When we think of holiness, we think of purity we think of something that is unblemished we think of something that is very clean very wholesome 
And holy means basically attached to God. For whenever you're attached to God, that's what makes you holy. Nobody is holy by themselves. They're only holy with God. That we should be holy, connected with him, and blameless before him. Because you can't be holy unless you're blameless. You can't be blameless unless you're in him. You can't be with him unless you become blameless. And only in him do we do that. Only in him. That's the beauty of this. I know. You know, I talk to my wife, and I love my wife. If y'all don't know that I love my wife, I really do love my wife. If my wife wasn't my wife, she'd have to be my girlfriend. If she wasn't my girlfriend, she'd have to be a distant cousin in a state that allows. And, and, and if she wasn't that, she'd have to be my pen pal. I mean, whatever happens, I want to make sure she's somewhere in my life. You hear what I'm saying? Now, why, is, why did I state that? As close as I want to be to her, God wants to be closer to us. That we are holy and blameless before him. He wants to be so close that no man can get closer than him. So, as we look in the scriptures here, in the next verse... Fifth verse says, and he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ. Now, this is what I was talking about before. This gets a lot of people messed up because they said, well, if he's predestined, does that mean God is chosen ahead of time? God laid out the destiny ahead of time for those that would be chosen by him that those would choose him. Somebody says, that's confusing to me. I get it. I get it, but that's the way it is. See, sometimes in the scripture, what you can't comprehend doesn't make it untrue. Just because I can't recount to you all the periodic table of all the, the names of all the materials and, and, and diamonds and gems and, and irons and all those types of things doesn't not make it true. God predestined those who would receive him to make sure that they had the path to him. Somebody says, well, doesn't he open it up for all? Absolutely. And those who will be, those he predestined, and those who will be in his will. Somebody says, but if he knows it, I said, just because he know it don't mean you know it. You have to carry it out. God knows the beginning from the end. But we have to live this thing out. Now, if you think about it as a parent, there's things you know about your child. There's things you can see coming up in your child's life, the way they're making it. But how many try to tell their child's life about them while they're not ready to even hear it? Or let me ask you this. If you're 60 and over, has your child ever come back to you and said, oh, you was right about that? Okay, it's not that you couldn't see it, but you couldn't explain it at that time. But you saw it destined to happen. But did you change the mind of your child? No, the child made decisions. Yet you knew the destiny. God has that to an nth degree that is so much deeper than we could ever think of. All right. Let's go to the sixth verse. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Okay? This is important. To the praise, in other words, the lifting up of him in his glorious gra grace. Now, what, is, what does that mean, glorious grace? In grace that shines with the ability to show forth God's happening, his presence, and his appearance. This is the glory of God, that we see him. See, you know, we sing songs like, Lord, come into this place, come into this house, rest on us, and all those things. Do you know God was here before we ever got here? But there is a manifestation of his presence where he says, and I want to show you my glory so you can know I'm there. See, God is everywhere. 
But at points he will show forth his manifestation so that we can praise and glorify him by seeing when he does it. That's why when someone receives Christ and is baptized, I believe we should throw a party. Because he's showing his glory in saving that individual. That's exactly what he's doing. And so with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now that's again, he made us happy to what? Be in his beloved. Now what is the beloved? Not just the ones that he says, I love you, but he says, I court you. I date you. I put a ring on your finger. I bring you to my house. I introduce you to those I love. I call you beloved because I've shown my love to be greater than you've ever been loved before. That's being in the beloved where God takes time with you. Where through our sins and through our downfalls and through our, our mistakes, he's still able to say, let me continue drawing you. Let me continue enamoring myself with you. Let me continue to bringing you to myself. That's the power of the creation of being chosen in Christ. Let's go to the next verse. And it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Now, redemption, what kind of word is that? If you were to describe the word redemption, what comes to mind? Someone give me a word. Don't say redemption because we already said that. Describe it without saying redemption. Somebody just take a gander at it. This is not a right and wrong. It's just an add to. What's that, sir? Brought you back? Exempted you back. Okay. Anyone else? Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's and then exactly what Deacon was saying. Redemption is a financial word. A word that has to do with property. A word that has to do with value. Has to do with money. And when it says, in whom we have redemption. In other words, a price was paid to give us back that which we lacked. And that was freedom from eternal damnation. Freedom from death. Remember, the Bible lets us know that Jesus said, as soon as you eat of the tree, you shall surely what? Die. This was redemption of a price from death. And it was paid through his blood. And, and I don't want to take a whole long time with this, but allow me, I want you to show, see the richness of this scripture. We were redeemed by his blood. Why the blood? What difference did the blood make? Why blood? Life is in the blood. How do we know that? We know that in your veins, blue takes place. But once it's outside of the body and oxygen touches it, it becomes red. In the beginning, the only thing that allowed a foretaste of the blood of Christ was the fact that when I sold fig leaves to cover me when I was naked, it wasn't good enough because I was taking from the earth that I now had made cursed and trying to cover myself. 
And what the Lord was basically saying by killing of a goat to give them skins to cover their nakedness, that something has to die to take place of the judgment. And it was the blood of Jesus Christ, it was his shedding of blood that the Father said, it's enough for me and whatever you ask, my son, it shall be done. Because you gave the ultimate when you did, and you can't, you can't be in the doghouse and pay the price too. Jesus was not sinful man. Though he was made in likeness of sinful man. And he redeemed us. He paid the price. Why is blood so important? Because it says someone's life has been given up. Let me give you an example. If you're in court and your brother did the deed. But you decide to go to jail. And the court's satisfied with that. Somebody paid the price and somebody was set free. Jesus paid the price that we might be set free through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. So the judgment comes from God that he says, you're now redeemed. Deacon. Amen. That's correct. It had, it had to be, and, and that's it. The blood is the symbol of the loss of life. Okay? That's, that's what shows. The blood is the symbol of the loss of life. And that's what redeems us. Now, this is, a, 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 this is very important. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, we think of sin for the sins of the world. And we think of sin as what Adam did. And we think of sins of what has passed down to Adam. But when it says here, according to the riches of his grace, what it basically is saying is that's not enough. Just to take care of that. Sawyer, for even the sins you will commit after you come to me, I've taken my grace and richness from the grace and made sure that it covered that too. For the Bible lets us know that when we ask for forgiveness, God will still forgive us. Why? Because the richness of his grace is still able to reach and say it's still effective for you today. Deacon? Amen. It's, it's important that we understand this because if I just think, oh, it's just been covered mankind. No, it was covered for you. Specifically, I may not commit the same thing someone else commits, but the blood still covers that. Somebody said, well, what are you saying? We have no, we have no uh, 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 responsibility to live according to be godly. Yes, we do. Absolutely. But it by itself is not enough. The blood of Jesus Christ still has to redeem you. You can't work enough to get the richness of his grace. Oh, well, he so, seems so godly. It ain't enough. Jesus is not going to say, oh, that was really godly stuff. He's still going to say, is it covered by Jesus? Is it covered by his blood? That's why the Bible tells us our righteousness as, is as what? Filthy rags. You should read the real interpretation of that. Amen. Did y'all you, you hear that? The greatest sin is not to believe. That's the beauty of this. It is based on belief. It's no action. It's no works that we redeem this by. It is strictly looking toward the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as our Redeemer for what he's made available to us. Let's look at the eighth verse here. Wherein, so according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. That's a, that's a different word, prudence. Okay? 
when he abound to us, in other words, it means he opened up to us these things. And when it talks about wisdom, wisdom is the astute use of knowledge to do something good. It's the astute use of knowledge. But prudence has more to do with understanding. Prudence is about understanding and insight. See, you can have wisdom of something, but not have insight. Now, let me give you uh, some, some understanding of that. Remember when Solomon asked for wisdom of God, how to govern the people of Israel? Solomon had great ability to take knowledge and use it astutely in situations. But he did not have the depth of insight to see that he had forsaken God by worshiping his concubines and wives, gods of their people and family. Insight takes you deeper into understanding. So it's not so. Let me give you another example. If I know a math problem and my teacher gives me a way of working out that math problem, I can work the math problem, but there's a difference between working the math problem and understanding how it works in. There's, there's a big difference there. I don't know if you all do this, but I, I did this when I was younger. It was really tough for me. I knew that my algebraic equations worked a certain way, and I could do it. But I'd be walking sometime, and, and, and all of a sudden, Bingo, it came to me. Not only could I duplicate what my teacher did, I now understood how it works. It was now insightful to me. It was no longer the mystery. And this is what the scripture is saying. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Wisdom and understanding. Ninth verse. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, mysterio, the mystery of his will. And, and understand, the Bible teaches us that we look through a glass darkly right now. There's things we see and we detect, but we're not necessarily sure of them. There is furtherance in God. See, a lot of people say, we've learned all we can learn about God. That's a lie from the pit. God is unfathomable. Somebody put it this way. He's so high, can't get over him. So low, can't get under him. So wide, you can't get around him. When you think you understand him, he opens up five more doors and say, learn of me. Why? Because the more you learn and understand, the closer you get, the more holy you become. Holiness is about being close to God, and he desires us to do that. So let's look at the, so it says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. The mystery of what? Will just concerning us? No, the mystery of the will concerning mankind. The mystery of the will concerning your neighborhood. The mystery of the will concerning your family. He has things that are hidden. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs that the glory of God is to hide a matter. And the glory of kings is to search it out. See, the, the devil tries to trick us into believing that once we become saved, there's no more to it than coming to church, reading your Bible, doing the prayer, going on fastings, treating everybody nice. But I will tell you, in anyone that has the Holy Spirit, there's something that tells you there's got to be more. And there's a reason why. Because he wants you to search him out. The Bible says, knock and the door shall be opened. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. He said, learn of me. I've got more for you. Do you really think the apostles showed us everything that God showed them? Absolutely not. 
They wrote epistles so that we'd get an idea, so that we'd have a code, code, <laughs> meaning a clue to where God's coming from. And that's the other thing I, I, I want to say that's important um, as we get ready to close here. To know the mystery of his will is to know when God is speaking to you. And part of knowing when God is speaking to you is starting to become aware of the different ways in which God speaks. Sometimes we're looking at an audible voice. Sometimes we're looking for this and that. Don't get hyped up in the, in the, in the miracleness of that. God uses all types of things to speak himself to us. Let me give you an example. Did he not speak about the sparrows? Did he not speak about the fig tree? Did he not speak? And in all of life is God's messages, and he expects us to pick them up as we start to understand his word. That's why one of the big things that I had to, um, it, it wasn't tough for me, but I had to really acknowledge it, was that my wife became a big part of how God speaks to me, even when she don't know he's speaking to me. And I, I, one day I just got on my knees and my legs and I just cried out to God. And, 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 and she asked me, she said, what made you do that? She says, I didn't believe that he'd allow me to marry somebody that could teach me about him even when she didn't know it. I said, how great is his love for me that he would take the time to allow me to marry somebody that shows me more about him. I said, oh, he must really want me to be saved. <laughs> Elder McCormick. Because he said, I got to keep her with him about 24 hours a day for this thing to work. But it's so that I would know him better. See, it's not her as much as him. That's why I glorify him and I edify her because it glorifies him. That's what Scripture says. Scripture lets us know that he that findeth a wife, what? Findeth a good, well, come on now. He that findeth a wife, findeth a good thing and obtains what favor from god if you don't acknowledge a favor you misuse it important so let's look at these last scriptures having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure we have purpose in himself god has things in which he's talked to himself about that he's created a purpose and a reason for doing things that he's discussed with himself. Meaning God does not reveal all things to all people when he's going to do it. Did he tell Abraham exactly where to go when he said, Abraham, get out your country? No. He said, go. Many times it's important that God not give us the whole map. Why? It's tough enough to believe when he says next day. Because how many of you all, when you get in a situation, start trying to figure out, how am I going to get this done? How am I going to figure this out? We get anxious and we get in those types of things. When God basically is saying, walk with me through this. Don't, I, I like how somebody says, uh, don't lose your cool. Believe him. Don't lose your cool. It's easy to lose your cool. Don't lose it. Because losing your cool will create more problems that you have to overcome when he had the solution ready for you. But that's all about faith. That's what faith is all about. When I don't see it, I see it in him, even when I can't see it in myself. That's why when Peter asked him, he says, well, who can be saved if trying to get wealthy and do those things? If a rich man can't get in, who can be saved? He said, with men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's why I don't care how bad one of you act. I know God has saved your life, and I declare by my own life that I will watch God perform his glory in your life. 
I don't even worry about it. I've seen folk that backslide and everything. I'd be like, you'll be back. Not even worried about it. They're like, how can you say that? I said, don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. I said, he, he's the one that's doing the work. All I'm doing is a witness to the fact that you can't beat God when you love God. See, half the folk that try to leave God really love them. They just don't know how to put out that love anymore. That's why we're around. Because the Bible says that when a brother's overtaken in the fold, ye which are spiritual, restore them in what? A spirit of what? Meekness, gentleness. In other words, don't get a stick and start beating them. Now, it says here in the 10th verse that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together and one all things in Christ. Uh, another chapter and verse to look at is 1 Corinthians 15, 25. These really go together. And Romans, the 8th chapter, the last two verses, and the ninth chapter. Uh, you can put those down. Those are great scriptures that coincide with this. But it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Now, that word dispensation does not mean seasons. That word dispensation does not mean time. That word dispensation means management of the household. So let me read it again. That in the management of his household, the fullness of times he might gather together one in all things in Christ. In other words, how God's managing this thing. See, I don't want you all to think God is taking his hands off. No matter how long it takes, remember, time and eternity don't mix. For God, it happened yesterday. You've got to see that. It happened yesterday. So in the management of his household, in the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. That means all things for Christ. All right? In the 11th verse, in whom also we have attained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Remember something, I want you to remember this. The scripture, there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, if God were to err, who would know it? See, there's a danger point that we get to when we say, I'm going to advise the Lord what to do. We seek him and seek his will and wisdom, understanding that he's devised how this happened. Somebody said, well, I'm older now. I'm 70 years old. Okay, that is no comparison to how old God is. All right? And the Bible says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Praise again, lifting him up. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, and that's what Deacon was saying, belief comes first. No matter what you do, your baptism, being filled with the Holy Ghost, all these things, if you don't believe, it doesn't make sense. You got to believe. He that believeth, he that believeth not, doesn't work. You got to believe. And belief isn't that intellectual knowledge believe. This is the belief that says there's an 18-wheeler coming down the road. I'm in the middle of the 18, uh, of the uh, interstate, and it's coming at me. Belief isn't I don't think it won't hit me. Belief is I get out the way so it don't hit me. That's faith. It causes an action to take place. All right. In whom ye have also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believe, and ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In other words, the Holy Spirit comes, and it is the earnest expectation. It is the down payment. It is God saying, I've stamped this one. Okay? This is my stamp. All right? Which is the earnest of our inheritance. In other words, it's the foretaste of what's coming. It is the order. It is the showing of who you are which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of our purchased possession. That is the finalization of our redemption through the redemption of our body. 
unto the praise of his glory. For when we are glorified in our body, we shall be able to praise him as we should. In other words, we don't run around the church five times and go, <laughs> we'll be where we can run a hundred million times and it won't make no difference. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, we got to stop here, y'all. I appreciate you. I, I hope you've learned something from what I stated before. If nothing else, I can tell you this. I've been edified by it. It blessed me, I'll tell you. And, and Deacon Marsh, I'm, I'm not going to look at you. I'm, boy, I'm looking at you real different now. Just don't go to no phone booths today, you know. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let, let us give right now. Think about our giving to the, to the uh, Sunday school. And we have our ways of giving through our um, QR code, through text to give GiveLify, PayPal, and through cash or check. So we're going to ask if you would at this time take, take some time to give specifically to the Sunday school for the edification of the knowledge and understanding that is given. Let's give the Lord a great hand clap by being chosen in him. Chosen in him. Hey, man, we're going to get ready to uh, pray over, to pray, and then we're going to uh, ask that you uh, govern yourselves accordingly because we'll be going into service very soon. Let us.